it has been a good day. I have had a good time, Calvin, too. We've been blessed. I, I get blessed sharing the word. I hope you have been blessed hearing the word. Uh, it's not just a, it's not a performance and let me show you what we know. Uh, it's a give and take. It is pouring into your lives and as you pull that, more comes out. So one of the reasons why we've had a successful little conference is because people have pulled the word out of us. I've been in places where it's sort of like just having to cram the word into them. And that is exhausting. Not exhausting having the word pulled out of you. So uh, not near as tired as you might think, uh, but it'll hit me tomorrow driving um, back to the uh, In the meantime, I want to close out tonight with Covenant Confidence. And how many of you know the Bible tells us that nothing is impossible with God? Are you with God? When you think of with God, think covenant. He and I have a covenant. So if nothing is impossible with God, and you are in a covenant in which you are a participant in what God offers, then never forget that nothing is impossible to the person who knows they have a covenant. And nothing is possible to the person who does not know that they have a covenant. So the reason why so many of us have seen so little success in different areas of our lives is that we have approached those areas of our lives through our wisdom, our ability, our history, our past, our performance. We have not approached those areas as covenant claimers. Remember what we said about David and his little stones and his slingshot? And he goes on to the battlefield against Goliath and he says, I come to you, uh, you're an uncircumcised Philistine, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. I have a covenant. And nothing was impossible to David because he knew he had a covenant. This is not a guy who lives the highest life, moral life. But he's a guy, and, and, and that's in no way to, to advocate lax morals. But when you start to understand covenant, you'll realize Christianity is not about whether you're highly moral or not. You'll start to understand that Christianity is about living in and resting in the power of the covenant. So what I want to do this evening is I really am on a long journey tonight to get to a, a favorite covenant story of mine. There's a couple of little things I want to uh, put into place before we get there. And so at times I'm going to, it might seem like I'm moving really fast. And it's because I know we got a lot of ground to cover. And we really can't do the covenant for services. Uh, we, we, may, we need about 40 services, and we might scratch the surface. So we're really trying to cram a lot of things in in, in a little compact part. So if we go a little quick, uh, apologies. Galatians chapter 3 is where I want to begin and do a little bit of work on understanding the promise of Abraham that is now yours. And then we're going to go take a glimpse, not an in-depth look, but a glimpse at the cutting of Abraham's covenant. And as I promised you today, we're going to take a look at Jesus on the cross and figure out what he meant when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We're going to bring all of this together when we're done so that you can leave with a confidence that you're living in the right covenant. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, today we, we illustrated that God gave Abraham a covenant of promise, and then 430 years later, God gave Israel a, a Sinai covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and that Jesus, when he went to the cross and was sold for 30 pieces of silver, God took that as Israel buying God out of his obligation of the covenant. Jesus lived the law to perfection for all of us who could never live the law to any perfection so that one man could go to the cross instead of every man going to the cross. One man could go as the representative perfect lamb. God would not inspect me at Calvary. God would inspect Jesus at Calvary. If he inspects me, it's over. If he inspects you, it's over. But if he inspects Jesus, the perfect law keeper, then someone's laying their life down that does not deserve to die. And God cannot take a life from someone who does not deserve to die. The wages of sin are what? If Jesus hasn't sinned, there's no paycheck with his name on it. He cannot die. That's why Jesus says, my life is not yours to take. My life is mine to lay down. And so at Calvary, he has to give up the ghost. His life won't leave. 
he can hang on that cross till now, and he cannot die. And so he has to release his spirit. The only reason he has to release it is because he's never committed a sin, and therefore his body doesn't know how to die. It's an incredible truth. And so Christ goes to die on our behalf, and God, who is forced to honor the fact that Jesus dies sinless, cannot leave him in the tomb. Because he has no sin to hold him there. Thus God brings him out and resurrects him as the perfect man. And now, thank God, on the other side of the Mosaic Covenant, views the promise he made to Abraham as now being fulfilled in Abraham's seed, not seeds. And Abraham's seed is Jesus. And so what we get out of the deal is knowing Jesus. How do we enter into a covenant with God? It's really useless. You wouldn't do much good if you could get into a covenant with God. Because what are you going to offer? What are you going to bring to the table? And so you come in through Christ, believing on Jesus. We come into the covenant. However, Paul said, as many as are of the works of the law. Paul did not say as many as are of the law. But he said as many as are of the works of the law. Now, that's not just semantics. Remember, we have the Sinai Covenant, which God doesn't honor anymore because he's been bought out and Jesus has fulfilled it. And so as far as God's concerned, this thing's done. In fact, if you read the, the epistles, the New Testament, you'll see the epistle writers talking about the last days, in these last days, in the last days. And they're not talking about the end of the world. They're talking about the end of the visual side of the Mosaic economy. And the visual side of the Mosaic economy was priests, and sacrifices and temples. All of that stuff that Paul said isn't from Jerusalem. And just a little, a little history lesson. In AD 70, Rome comes in, knocks that temple down, burns it to the ground, takes the priesthood out, burns all the Jewish genealogical records, tears the altar to the ground. There's no more sacrifices, there's no more priests, and there's no more temple after AD 70. The end of the Jewish heaven on earth. And the visual's gone. Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, said not one stone shall be left unturned from this temple. It'll all be gone. What did that mean? It meant there was nothing to go back to. Amen. Amen. So it's all over. Now notice, Paul doesn't say for as many of you as are under the law. Why? Because no one's under the law. There's no law to be under. Why is there no law to be under? Because Jesus paid it all. But we still work the law. Why? As many of us as are working the law are under the curse that was attached to the law. So in reality, Paul is now talking to a body of believers who keep working that which is dead. They keep performing for a God who's already been satisfied. As if he's not been satisfied. And what happens is they move underneath the curse of the law. What is that curse? That curse is condemnation and shame and a performance mentality and the feeling that we're always in lack and the feeling that we always owe God. That's the curse the law drove with it. Israel had that on them all the time. You don't have to live that way, but Paul said if you're underneath its performance, then you're going to feel like you're underneath its curse. But, and I don't want to stay here too long, but I want you to notice he doesn't say if you're under the law. He says if you're working the law. Because none of you are under the law. So stop working like you are. Eleven. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by what? The just shall live by faith. If you were justified by the law, you wouldn't need faith. Because remember what we told you, faith was shut up until the law came. So if the just shall live by faith, then the just can never live by their works. What's the opposite of faith? It's working. Doing things on our own while faith is believing he can do them. So, no one's justified by the law because the just live by faith. Yet the law is not a faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. You don't need faith, you just need to do it. Thirteen. This is key. Christ has redeemed us from the curse attached to this law. How did he do that? Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So when Jesus died on the cross, which was not the Roman, which was not the Jewish way of execution, he did not commit a Roman crime. He committed a Jewish crime. And yet, the Jewish form of death would not have marked him as a curse. The Jewish form of death would have been to stone him to death. But the Pharisees very much wanted the crowd to feel like he was cursed of God. Because if the crowd believes he's cursed of God, they're not going to follow him. Because why would they follow a man whom God fights against? 
Listen, guys, when, the, when Jesus died on the cross, the disciples were convinced they had backed the wrong horse. They were convinced they had lost because he died on a tree and cursed is the man that dies on a tree. And who does the cursing? God. So why would I brag about being a follower of Jesus? Do you know why Peter is warming his hands by the fire when they're about to put Jesus on a cross? Because he sees which way the wind's blowing. He knows that Jesus is now standing in front of Pilate. And Pilate has the power to put him on a cross. And if he goes on a cross, it means God curses him. And if God curses him, he must be wrong. And so Peter warms his hands and goes, I don't know him. The downward spiral of what Calvary represented to everything that we had known under the law, because by, by the legal standards, to die on a piece of wood means to die cursed of God. Was it just he wasn't really cursed of God? They just thought he was cursed of God, or boy, they should have known better that God wasn't cursed. No, he really was dying, cursed by God. God intentionally has the execution of his son happen on a cross. It's also the reason why Jesus came at the perfect time in man's history. There's a very brief window in man's history where the most common form of execution was a cross. And since Deuteronomy had already prophesied that cursed is the man that hangs on a tree, Jesus goes to a cross as the cursed. So God doesn't curse Jesus because Jesus has failed. God places a curse due to us because of the law onto the one who has never failed under the law so that all of us would never have to be cursed under the law ever again. And yet we seem infatuated with doing our best to work the law. And Paul said, for those of you who keep trying to work the law, why would you work what Jesus was cursed to set you free from? And he closes with this closes this thought. That the blessing of Abraham, way over here, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ, way over here, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what Jesus was doing was ushering not just Israel. See how we've built on these blocks today? Was not just ushering Israel out of the Mosaic Covenant into a new he was ushering the whole world into a new covenant. Paul specifically says, so that the blessings of a man named Abraham might come on the Gentiles. How many of you realize Abraham was a Gentile? Why do we all think Abraham was a Jew? You know, Judaism did not come until later. That's the religion of the Jewish people. Abraham had no religion. He had a voice saying, come out. And he said, okay. And God said, he's righteous. He's a Gentile. Burr of the Chaldees. Did you realize that God's first covenant he cut with the single man was with the Gentile? So that the representative man, Jesus, could deliver us from the religion of the world and so that all the Gentiles might walk into the promise of the Holy Spirit by faith. You were not God's afterthought. You were God's first thought. He didn't lose Israel so he come and got America. He didn't lose Israel so he come and got the rest of the world. No, his whole intent was the whole family of earth. What did he say to Abraham? Through you shall the whole families of the earth be blessed. I want to touch the whole wide world through the action of your faith, Abraham. How awesome. Now, which covenant are we in? Well, we, we, my goodness, I think we, we pretty much have exhausted this, this dude right here. I mean, Israel didn't want in it. God didn't want in it. Israel bought him out. God let him out. Jesus fulfilled the whole thing. Calvary said, it is finished. I mean, we're done. Paul said, if you're in it, you're just in its works. You can't be in it because it doesn't exist. He says, well, why would you stay there? So where are we? Well, we're, we, we don't go backwards on the clock. We go forward. That's who our God is. But he loved the covenant he cut with Abraham. He was satisfied with it. He was happy with it. He wished Israel had been happy with it. I mean, what if when they had gotten to Sinai and God said, I'm going to go up here and cut a covenant. What if when he had come back down with the Ten Commandments, instead of saying, whatever God says to us, we are well capable of doing it. What if Israel had said, no, we want Abraham's covenant. We want the one you started with. You ever wondered what God 
God might have done? I'll tell you exactly what God did. He's always been excited for people to appeal to his mercy. He comes to Abraham and he says, there's sin in Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to kill the whole bunch. And Abraham says, boy, I wish you'd reconsider that. And God says, y'all, yeah, it's pitiful. It's, it's, it's a messed up place. And Abraham says, what if you find 50 people that are righteous? Would you spare it for 50 people? And God says, yeah, I'd do it for 50 people. I think you know where this goes. Watch the heart of God. He's easily intrigued. He always wanted mercy. And Abraham goes, you know, 50 is high. That's a big number. <laughs> I've been to Sodom. Because I tell you what, God, what if, you can find, what if you can find 40 people? Would you do it? And God says, that's cool. I'll do it for 40. And Abraham says, that's, that's still pretty bad. Says, that's going to be tough. I'll tell you what, 30. If you can find 30 people, would you do it? And God never hesitates. Every time God says, I'll save you for 30. He's just watching Abraham. Eye contact. Abraham says, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to ask one more time, so I'm really sorry. And I'm pushing it. 20 people, because I'm really worried. 30 is big. 20 people, you spare for 20 people. And God says, I'll spare for 20 people. And Abraham says, have mercy on me. I'll only ask one more time. What if you can find 10? Will you spare for 10? And God said, I'll spare for 10. The only thing I've always wished is that Abraham had just kept going. He stopped. What if he had said, I just want to ask you what you think God would have done. What if he had said, God, I'm sorry for asking. What if you just find one? Will you spare for one? What do you think God would say? This might tell me a little bit about what you think about the nature of God who always wanted Abraham's covenant. He loved Abraham's covenant. <laughs> I, I'm not faulting Abraham. I just wish he had pushed it a little farther. <laughs> what did he have to lose? I mean, God was going to burn him up anyway. <laughs> right? He, said, he could have just said, Lord, I just, you know, what if there's just one? <clears throat> the heart of God is always to do mercy, not sacrifice. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? The Pharisees got mad because the disciples were eating without washing their hands. And Jesus said, you go find out what this means. God prefers mercy, not sacrifice. It was always the heart of God to do good and to be good and to show mercy. Right? So we're Abraham's seed. Where are we? We're, we're in that spot. Now, to really understand how secure you are over here, knowing that this is really just a mirror of the one God's already done through Abraham. To really get an idea of how secure you are, let's just take a glimpse at it. Can't go into too much detail here or too long. There's some, some stuff I really want to do tonight in the Word. But we really want to take a look at a snapshot of the Abraham Covenant. Just how it happened, how God did it, what it looked like. So go to Genesis chapter 15, and we'll go to the seventh verse. We'll do a pretty, pretty much a straight run through, and then we'll jump over to another verse in just a second. You got that? You got it? All right, Genesis chapter 15, verse 7. God says to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. How do you get this land? You inherit it. Inheritance means your dad gives it to you. Right? If, you if you get an inheritance, you don't, you don't owe anything. So already God is saying, I'm going to give you everything you're not going to have to do anything anymore. This is pretty simple. And he said, Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Oh, wait, man. And he's a pretty slick guy. He comes out by faith. He's got a lot of confidence that God told him to leave. But he's a lot like us. He needs reassurances that God's going to do what God said he would do. And then he says, how, how do I know that you're going to give it to me? And so God, who does not have to do this, he doesn't have to show us anything. Right? He can just speak the word. So much of what God does is for your benefit. It's not for his benefit. You remember when Jesus shows up at Bethany and Lazarus has been dead for four days? And Jesus says, Father, I am praying out loud, not because I don't believe, but because they don't believe. Remember that? I've always loved that moment. It tells me Jesus wasn't real prone to praying out loud. He just talked to his daddy inside all the time. But every now and then, people around him were so full of doubt, he would talk out loud so they'd know what was going on. 
They had so little spiritual discernment, he vocalized his conversations with his dad just so people would realize that it was all cool. <laughs> uh, he went through a lot of things that he didn't have to go through just so other people, you know, he could always just speak the word, but he, but he sometimes showed them something. God's going to do the favor. First time. Bring me a three-year-old left for a three-year-old female, go three-year-old grand, turtle dove, young pigeon. I don't want to break all this down. We do that in our book between pieces. He brought all these to him. Abraham brings them to God. And he cuts them in two. Now, Jeremiah will tell you, we don't jump there right now, but Jeremiah will tell you that when two parties cut a covenant, they cut an animal in half, they put it on the ground, and they walk between the pieces. So you get that information later in the Old Testament. So we just apply that knowledge to Genesis. He brought them, he cuts them in two, down the middle, puts each piece opposite the other. This is, we're, we're setting up the covenant ceremony. But he didn't cut the birds in two. When the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. That, that tells me, I mean, it takes a while for vultures to come down on the carcass, right? This is, you don't just throw it out on the ground and boom, all of a sudden, vultures on the carcass. It tells me that God didn't do anything for a few days. Abram lays the, the, the animals on the ground, pours the blood, and sets it weights. And nothing happens. And I think Abram gets nervous. The reason I think Abram gets nervous is because when the vultures show up, Abram works to kill the vultures. He shoes them off the meat. He's concerned that... You know, they're going to take his sacrifice away. 11, 12. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Don't, don't be turned off by horror and great darkness. The Old Testament often uses fear or horror in a way in which we don't understand the English. It often means awe. There's fear and there's trembling. Which even the New Testament does that as well. That's just an interpretation issue. I think what happens in Genesis 15, 12, and I'm, again, I'm just giving you a snapshot, is God watches Abram help with the covenant. And the moment Abram starts helping shoo the vultures off the, the uh, sacrifice, God puts him to sleep. Which means that God is eliminating Abraham from the covenant ceremony. God had Abram lay the pieces down. Abram thought he was going to enter into a covenant with God. What do two parties do in a the covenant? They walk in between the pieces and they share a covenant meal. So Abram probably gets the meal ready and he's, he's all prepared. And three or four days later, nothing happens except birds drop down and start trying to eat the meat. And Abram goes out and shoots them. And God looks down and says, I'm going to have to get Abraham out of the equation. Because I don't want to enter into a covenant in which Abraham feels responsible for the other end of the covenant. So I'm going to put Abraham to sleep, and I'm going to do it all by myself. <laughs> so when Abraham falls asleep, look at this, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, what's happening to Abraham? According to previous verse, he's asleep. When the, when the sun goes down and it's dark, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces. Abraham slept right through. But God showed up in two ways in which he's often described throughout the Bible. Our God is a consuming fire, and Jesus is the light of the world. A furnace and a torch walk past one another at Abraham's covenant while Abraham snoozes. So it's literally the Father and the Son entering into a covenant, and Abraham gets to be the recipient. So that Abraham can't mess it up. Because he didn't help. He wakes up the next day. He says, what happened? You know, there, I think there's footprints in the blood. And he realizes, I missed it. Oh, boy. Here's a free. Abraham doesn't walk like a covenant guy for a while. And the Lord showed me this here a while back when I was... I was preaching messages on communion. And the Holy Spirit spoke in my heart and said, go back and investigate Abraham. Watch how much better his life gets in how he externalizes the covenant. Later in his life, God visits him. By the 10th, three angels show up one day to Abraham. Remember that? 
This is right before they go to Sodom. Kill Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abram yells at, at Sarah, Hey, cook some food and bring it out here. We're going to have a meal. And the Bible says Abram brings food out and they eat. I believe, and from that moment on, it's a different Abraham. I think when he shared the covenant meal over his covenant, he walked into an awareness of his covenant. This is why, this is another reason I'm so passionate about communion. And so Abraham had very little understanding of what was his because he didn't eat the meal that night. He slept right good. So God shows up later to have a meal with him. Jesus will take care of that at the Last Supper when he says it's with a great epithemia, a great lust that I've lusted to eat this meal with you because I'm going to go tomorrow and Daddy and I are going to pass between the pieces at the cross, but I want you to eat it. I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood because even though you're not going to walk through the pieces with us, you don't belong there. You'll just mess it up. Daddy and I will take care of it. But I want you to get all the benefits. Wow. Yeah, that's good. So good. I want so you to get all the benefits. Daddy and I will take care of the tough stuff. But you just get to eat. Yeah. Right. Daddy and I will cook. You get to eat. Daddy and I will do the dishes. You get to kick back and put your feet up. Right. It's amazing. <laughs> so at Calvary, you are not a participant. You are not involved. You do not contribute anything except put the sin into Jesus that curses him at Calvary. That's my role at Calvary. That's, it's not exciting. It's sad. But all that we contributed at Calvary was the necessity of a perfect man to die for us imperfect people. For all of our stupidities and our sillinesses and our filth and our ignorance, Jesus would take it into himself. For all of our, uh, our cheating and our lying and our theft and our blasphemy and our murderous tongue and our terrible thoughts, Jesus would take it into him and be the substitutionary man. It, it's overwhelming to me. It, I, I, how, how can I be obsessed with people's actions when I so clearly see me in Jesus dying on Calvary yes. and so clearly see you? Yes. You get a real picture of the covenant. You'll never again judge people by the way they act. The days of judging people the way they act and be gone. You can't. How can you? You put him there too. No, no, no greater or lesser. He equally placed him there. And, and, and in him, he said, I want you to go to sleep. And daddy and I will do it. We'll take care of this covenant issue. So at Calvary, Jesus hangs between heaven and earth and says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which has prompted so many well-intentioned sermons on the fact that at Calvary, God forsook Jesus. Here's how we've heard it. Here's how we've preached it, even in the Grace Church. God forsook Jesus so that he'll never forsake you. God punished Jesus so that he'll never punish you. And while God did a lot of things at Calvary so that he'll never have to do them to you, one thing you can rest assured of tonight is God never abandoned his son at Calvary. And there's a very important reason why I want you to get this. I'm going into deep water, okay? But it's not overwhelming. It's in the scriptures, and we'll show you the word. And let the Holy Spirit say it to you or reject it. It's all I ever ask anybody when they look at the word. Either let the Holy Spirit speak it into your heart or say, no, I don't buy that. I think you're going to see something powerful when you see the Father refusing to turn his back on his son at the cross. And here's why. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me is not original. Jesus isn't making it up. Jesus isn't just saying it because he feels like God's left him. In fact, Jesus doesn't feel like God's left him at all. Jesus says it at the cross because at the cross is a lot of confusion. His own disciples have abandoned him. The people that are there to watch him die think he's cursed by God. They think Rome wins and the disciples lose. For all they know, they've wasted three and a half years of their life following a quack from Nazareth that they never should have followed in the first place because obviously he was wrong. I mean, for Pete's sake, they chose Barabbas, a known murderer, and put the carpenter on the cross. Who do you think lost? Amen. That's their feeling. And as Jesus hangs at Calvary, he has one chance to preach one more sermon. Because everybody will listen to the dying words of the dying man. You give him the benefit of the doubt. You'll hear what it is he has to say. And while we get obsessed with it is finished and I thirst and son here is your mother and mother here is your son, Jesus actually quotes scripture on the cross. Next. Psalm 22.1, my God, my God. Why 
Why did you say to me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Now what we're not going to do tonight is do an expose on every verse of the 22nd Psalm. Because as you've already seen, I have a hard enough time doing a two-verse expose out of the New Testament, much less to cover the entire 22nd Psalm. We'll be here until Thursday. I, while that does sound appealing, we're going to just let you do a lot of homework on your own. Right? What we will do is hit some highlights of Psalms 22. And what I want you to know is this. What Jesus was doing was pointing his audience at where they could go to figure out what he was doing and who he was. Because there was not a single passage in the Old Testament that told you who the man was that would die on the cross. In fact, there wasn't even a single passage in the Old Testament that told you that the Messiah was going to die on the cross. Did you know that? So they're flying blind, man. As far as they know, the Messiah is going to lift up a sword and beat up Caesar. (coughs) Jesus is changing the game. I mean, Isaiah 56 is great. Isaiah 56 surely was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. But it would take Peter way up into his ministry to really grab the importance of that passage to realize that that was Jesus. But Psalms 22 was so specific that if you would read it, you would realize that what was happening at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the hill outside of the walls of Jerusalem had to be fulfillment of this scripture. So Jesus quotes the first verse of Psalms 22 so that his learned audience, those who put him on the cross, which were the only ones that could read anyway, and they were the only ones that had access to the book of Psalms, would go back to their offices, sit down at their desk, unfurl the 22nd Psalm because it struck a chord. It was familiar. Literally, Jesus sang this verse on the cross. Because for a Jew, you didn't quote psalms, you sang it. A cappella. So Jesus sings the melody of, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he stops. So that his audience that knows Psalms 22 will recall the jingle their grandma sang to them, which started out with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And just like you can hear the first line of a song you have memorized, they do the next line, and the next line, and the next line, and look at some of the stuff they began to recall. My strength is dried up like a posture. My tongue clings to my jaws. You brought me to the dust of death. Dogs surround me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Uh-huh. Yeah. Jesus has grabbed his audience and said, go see if you can figure out why. In the 22nd Psalm, they pierce his hands and his feet and take a look at this man on the cross and see if you can figure out what's happening to him. Maybe, just maybe, we found the same God. I cap my bones, they look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. That's unbelievable. In the Gospels, they literally toss dice for the robes of Jesus. And they tear his garment in half and split it amongst themselves, the soldiers at Calvary. And Psalms called it, said it would happen. And at Calvary, for those confused, Jesus sings the psalm so they'll know where to find it. He didn't want to die with you left in the dark. He wanted to die so you could live in the light and realize why this was happening. For he has not despised nor abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from him. But when he cried, he heard it. God did not turn his back on his son. Same book, same chapter, same song. And Jesus is never abandoned to Calvary. He's not saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God left him. If God left him, you don't have a covenant. There has to be two parties at a covenant cutting. Just in case you think we're kooky and off our rock. Let's still get you a crazier man than I. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 5.18 For all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was where? In Christ. In Christ, 
reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Where was God when Jesus was dying? In Christ. In Christ. He never left him. It wasn't a solo act at Calvary. It was God and his son passing between the pieces. <coughs> and just so you'd know which covenant God was copying, <coughs> he made the sun go black and the earth to tremble. Just like it did the night that the smoking furnace and the burning lamp passed between the pieces in Genesis 15. The earth trembled in the moment when God put himself at Calvary and shook. Because not even the foundations of the earth could stand to see God. The perfect sacrifice lays life down for the imperfect people. And watch God and Jesus pass between the pieces of Calvary. The darkness that happens at Calvary is not God turning his back on his son. The darkness at Calvary is that moment where the two shadows pass one another. And you're born in that moment. The church finds its birth right there. And the Roman soldier tosses a spear up in the air grabs it in his hand and walks to the cross and has no idea that he's about to birth the church metaphorically forever. He takes that spear point and he shoves it up underneath the rib of Jesus and the spear point hits the heart of Christ surrounded by water, exhausted from his body pulling up and down, up and down, up and down, his heart failing and the water explodes around the heart and the heart explodes with the water and blood and water spray the soldier at the cross that day. And just like God would put Adam to sleep and lift his arm and pull Eve out of his side, at Calvary, as Jesus goes to sleep, God lifts his arm and pulls the church out of his side. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives the way Christ loves the church. He washes her off with the water of his word. He speaks over her good things, saved by his blood, cleansed by his words. We are that one beneath the crimson flood, birthed into the marriage with our heavenly husband. Yes. There's so much to blow your mind at Calvary, and yet for most of us it's a trinket around our neck or hanging from our rearview mirror or a, pig, or a little sign on our wall. But everything in the universe changed yes. when God hung himself on a cross. Everything changed for time and eternity. And yet we worship like the cross never happened. Wow. We go to church week after week after week talking about God, talking about performance, talking about how good we're doing, talking about getting home, talking about leaving the earth, talking about terrorism, talking about governments, talking about presidents, talking about politics, while it takes a sermon series to get anything out of Jesus from us. <laughs> we literally have to put him in a series to hype him up in case somebody will show up I was just recently when in our hometown, the pastor announced me. The next three weeks, we're going to preach on Jesus. And I thought, God help the other 49. 52 weeks in a year, we get three. We get three on the man that changed the world. It's terrible, isn't it? It'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. The reality is, yes. Jesus is a forgotten character in the modern church. We call ourselves Christians but are embarrassed of Christ. Because he's so different. He's a stumbling stone. He's the rock of offense. There's nothing about him. It's anything like anything else. He doesn't quarter religion. He doesn't take our works. He stands opposite of everything we ever know through the system of the world. And yet it's as if, if we talk about him, we might hurt someone's feelings. We might have to deal with our own death. We might have to look at our own mortality. We might have to face a covenant in which God doesn't need your help. And it's terrible to build churches that way. And it's terrible to raise money that way. Because you can't manipulate people. And you can't browbeat people. And you can't intimidate people. And you can't scare people. You can't make them think if they don't give, they're going to go to hell. And if they don't come to church, they're going to miss out with God. And releasing people into the glorious liberty of being Abraham means they might not need you anymore. <laughs> And the greatest place to be in ministry is free from the needs of people. Yes. Free from the dependency. And Jesus, with a, I think, with a great sigh, said to his disciples, ah, I'm leaving. <laughs> but here's where it got good for Jesus. But don't worry. I'm going to send you 
another comforter. Mm -hmm. He's going to lead you and guide you into places I can't lead you. Oh, don't ever insult the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. You've never seen anything like the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus with a grin said, there are things I can't tell you that I'd like to tell you, but when he gets here, he'll tell you. <laughs> Man, that means to me, the Holy Ghost is everything. He's, he's, he's my liberation from sin. What sets me free from sin? What we said in the afternoon session, the law of the spirit of life yeah. in Christ Jesus has made me free from yeah. the law of sin and death. I'm not lawless. I'm under a new law. Yeah. Amen. I'm not under a law of performance. I'm under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Yeah. I'm governed by the law of liberty in my soul. Yes. It speaks to me about what to do, when to do it, how to do it, how to say it, where to go. It's a glorious liberty of knowing that he speaks up through you. Lives inside of you. God was cutting now, we can stop, and we've had a great meeting in Kalamazoo. And I was done, and the Holy Spirit put on my heart one more story from the Word. So, if you have the time. We have time. You have time. We have time. You got till Thursday. <laughs> well, I don't. I'm booked somewhere Wednesday, so we're going to have at least 24 more hours, okay? Um... I want to go, go back to something we mentioned briefly. I don't know which session it was. I lose track of when. And that was the, the, the covenant between David and John. And David is a covenant guy. He's lived his whole life by covenant. He, he kills Goliath by covenant. He's going to become king by covenant. He, everything he is. David's about 20 years old. Maybe 21. Goliath's been dead about four years. David has spent the last few years wandering. He hasn't made really good decisions politically. Some of the decisions he made actually got him in trouble with Saul. That's for another story. But David and Jonathan get tight. Jonathan is the rightful next king of Israel. He's the prince of Israel. He's a warrior. He's great in battle. He's a great communicator. In the eyes of the world, guys, he would make a great king. He's everything his dad is and everything his dad isn't. And his dad was taller than his fellows, a warrior, loved by the people. But his dad's not loyal. His dad doesn't have a heart for God. Jonathan's got it all. Jonathan is one of the more unheralded people in the history of the Bible for knowing his place and being completely content with where God called him. If you want to see what it looks like to find the will of God for your life and then be happy with it, even when it doesn't look like everyone thinks it should look, look at Jonathan. Jonathan, although he has every characteristic quality and the legal right to the throne, knows when he's around this kid, David, there's something special about this kid. There's an anointing that oozes out of David's pores, man. He's not just a giant killer. He's talented. He's a musician, a songwriter, a singer. He has a shepherd's heart. He's a pastor of pastors. He loves people. He's the most compassionate man Jonathan's ever met in his life. He's not just a warrior, but he's a warrior's warrior. And Jonathan admires him, loves him, believes he's the greatest thing he's ever met. Jonathan knows that the Holy Spirit lives around this kid, David. I don't know if he was there when Samuel anointed him, but he's heard the story how 98-year-old Samuel takes a horn of oil and pours it over the top of David's head, and it drips down between his toes, and Samuel says, I found the next king. And basically says to God, but you've got to make it happen, because there's no way Saul's going to let this kid live. There's no way. Saul's already got a son. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'll probably be dead when it happens. And he was. 
And they did a Jonathan make a covenant with one another. They take an animal and they cut it in half. The Bible doesn't tell you this, but according to the book of Jeremiah, if you make one, this is what you do. They take an animal and they cut it in half and pour the blood in between, just like Abraham did. And they pass between the pieces and they clasp hands and they share a covenant meal. And in that covenant, David, Jonathan promises David, I got your back, man. You're supposed to be the next king. If my dad sends out forces looking for you, I'll always herald you. I'll always tell you when you're in trouble. I'll tell you when to stay away. I'll tell you where dad is. You'll always have a heads up on the army. I'm your inside man. I'm a spy against my own father. And what I want you to do for me, you're going to outlive me. I'm going to die in battle gloriously. But you're going to live because God's picked you. I'm not mad about it. But I'm going to take advantage of it. You see, I'm not going to be here to take care of my family, but you are. So what I'm going to ask you to do for me is I want you to be good to my lineage. And they shake on it. And David says, you got it. Now, word spreads throughout Israel that David is a bad guy. I want you to realize that the king runs the propaganda machine. So in the average village and hamlet of Israel, David's the bad guy. He's the wicked one. Saul's the good guy chosen by God. Samuel picked me. I don't know who this young upstart punk is or who he thinks he is. But if you see him in your town, you let me know and I'm going to come and get him. So David lies low. And then Saul and Jonathan and all of his brothers go to war. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, Saul and Jonathan are all dead at the battle of Gil Mount Gilboa. And word spreads throughout Israel. Second Samuel 4, 4. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was laying at his feet. He was five years old when the news came about Saul and Jonathan from Jezreel. What was the news? Saul's his dad. Or Jonathan's his dad. Saul's his granddad. They're both dead. They lost at the, Mount, at the battle of Mount Gilboa against the Philistines. The Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. David, David wasn't even there to fight. He couldn't fight for Israel because Israel wanted to kill him. Greatest warrior in the world. Was not allowed to participate in the battle. God had better plans. Now, what do you know? What's the inside stuff that you know? You know that David and Jonathan had a covenant, right? In fact, God takes you behind the scenes in the book of Samuel and shows you these two guys meeting in a field, and clasping hands and hugging and kissing on the cheek and saying, I got your back and you got my back. You know it, but they don't. And what they don't know is going to hurt the next generation. The nurse grabs him up and flees, and it happened as she made haste to flee. He fell down and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. I believe the rumor flies through Israel when Saul and Jonathan die at Mount Gilboa. Watch out for David. He's been a snake in the grass waiting for his chance to take the throne. So I advise all of the family of Saul to flee now because David's going to come and kill you. But what they didn't know that you know, that the reader of the Bible knows, is David wasn't coming to kill little Jonathan's little boy. Why would he? He had a covenant. In fact, if he shows up, he's going to grab that little boy and raise him as his own. But the nurse doesn't know there's a covenant. And because she doesn't know there's a covenant, she grabs five-year-old Maribel, which is what Chronicles calls him. Maribel means contender with Baal. Jonathan named his kid something great. You're going to fight the enemy, Maribel. And the nurse grabs up five-year-old Maribel and drops him in her haste. Maybe she's trying to grab too much stuff. And little Maribel hits the ground rolls down the stairs and breaks both of his legs. And then the Bible does something odd. In one sentence, changes his name. He's never called Maribel again outside of the Chronicles. Now he's Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth in the Hebrew means destroying shame. A shame that destroys from this moment forward, Mephibosheth is laying on both of his feet. Laying on his feet means he can walk, but he cannot walk right. And so every step he takes, every mangled, crippled step he takes, reminds him of what he was probably taught at his sixth birthday. Do you know why you're a cripple? <clears throat> because mean old David was coming to kill you, and we saved your life. And so to Mephibosheth, Satan is a man named David, who before long is king of Israel. And Mephibosheth hides out, raised by a distant family member, never goes to town, stays on his own property so nobody sees his mangled legs. 
Never to be reminded of his daddy Jonathan or his granddad Saul. And nobody ever tells him about the covenant because there's only one man on the planet that even knows the covenant exists. David. He was the only guy in the field. Him, Saul, and the Holy Ghost that decided to write it down for you and Samuel. And the finish chef sits every day in that little cabin waiting to die. Because when your name means shame that destroys, the shame is destroying you. The shame of your heritage, the shame, the shame of your legs, the shame of who you are and what you are. Next. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Or 2 Samuel chapter 9. Is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Why does David say this? Because he remembers he has a covenant. Some cultures would cut their hand open at covenant. And, and hold that hand together to exchange blood. There's no evidence whether the Jews did this or not. It's possible. Maybe one day David is sitting on his throne, governing, and his hand hurts. He got a lot of battle wounds, man. You're a warrior, you got a lot of scars. He's probably counted them all, showed his kids, his grandkids, here's where this one happened, this one happened. Maybe that day he looked across his hand and noticed that scar and thought, what was that? Maybe at first he misapplied it. It was a battle. He let it go. And then one day he realized, oh, you know what that was? Here's the key word. John. That's John. You know what? I gotta do something. I gotta make amends. I made Jonathan promise. We had a covenant. I know Jonathan's not here to hold me to it, but I'm a man of honor. And if I'm in a covenant, I'm gonna keep my end of the deal. Is there anybody left of the house of Saul so that I can be good to them for Jonathan's sake? Next one. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. When they called him David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is laying at his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David said, By the way, Lodabar means desert place. So Mephibosheth is hiding out, man. He's as far away as he can get. The king, King David said, Brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Before we go to the next verse, can you imagine this moment whenever the chariot of the king, with the king's flag, rolls up the front? Of Mephibosheth's little cabin in Lodabar. He's been hiding out his whole life, dreading the day this happens, and quite sure that it will, because the king always kills all of his enemies. And so it's on this day, no doubt, Mephibosheth says, Here's the moment. I'm going to get my house in order. Kids, it's been good. I love you. But this is my time. I've always imagined this had to be a frightening moment. The day the chickens come home to roost. The day my sin catches up with me. The day belonging to the wrong family costs me my life. I've been waiting for it. I've hid out. But you can't fight it. You can't hide forever. The justice of God is swift. If David's really God's man, I'm in trouble because I'm not God's man. I'm done for. There's no hope for me. I can only hide from the justice of God for so long. Verse 6. When Mephibosheth, the son of John, the son of Saul, came to David, he fell down on his face prostrated himself. And then David said, Mephibosheth? He doesn't say a word. He just falls down like a dead dog in front of the king. It's like a rag doll in the king's presence. And David says, Mephibosheth? And he said, here's your servant. David said to him, do not fear. God, this is a beautiful verse. I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. You get it all, kid. I'm going to bring back everything you lost. And you get to eat at my house. Get out of the desert place. You're going to eat at the king's table. So he bows himself and says, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? 
And the king called the Zeke, Saul's servant, and he said to him, I have given to your master's son everything that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him. I'm not even going to make this guy work for himself. You're going to work the land for him, and you're going to bring in the harvest so that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, will always eat that bread at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. In one moment, Mephibosheth is 35 field hands. From a man who lives in the house of Lodabar, hiding from the king, walking around on crippled legs, to a man who will eat every meal at the king's right hand. You talk about winning the lottery. <laughs> in a world where life expectancy was low, Mephibosheth just went through the ceiling. In a world where he has had destroying shame hanging over his head every day, covenant saved his life. Paul would write this to the Ephesian church. Forgive one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Did you catch that? Why did God forgive you? For Christ's sake. Why did God put you in this covenant? For Christ's sake. Not for your sake. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You don't deserve it. But God doesn't do it because of you and your crippled legs and your desert place and your lack of production. God does it because he says, look at that nail scar in my hand. Is there anybody that I can be kind to? For Jesus' sake. Man. Man. It's incredible. When you came into Christ, you came into the joys of your Lord. You came into the eating at the Master's table. And although lame on your feet, look, look, watch, it's not done. It's as good as it is. Watch out. Zeba says to the king, according to all my Lord, the king has commanded his servant, so your servant will do it. You bet you will. He didn't have to say this. I mean, his head will roll if he doesn't do it. <laughs> As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table. Please underline. This is why I like people still carry their Bibles. Because my God, you need to underline something once in a while. This is one you need to underline. <laughs> You're going to eat at my table like one of the king's kids. Amen. Amen. Yes. You belong in my family now. I'm going to set you right up here with my boys. When my boys come to the table, you come to the table. When they eat, you eat. When they drink, you drink. Anybody's got a problem with it, you tell them to come see me. I'm doing this for your daddy's sake. Wow. Me and your daddy have a covenant. We pass between the pieces. And I'll never forget it, and I'll never forget it. And because I love him, I love you. I don't even know you. <laughs> Frankly, I might not even like you if I got to know you. I don't care if you eat me out of house and home. When I see you, I see your dad in your eyes. You're a reflection of that man I loved so much that day in that field. And I'm going to let you sit at this table every day for the rest of your life. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. God bless old Micah. He's just this blessed, best day of his life. <laughs> and all who dwelt in the house of Zebah were servants of Mephibosheth. Now watch this little twist of darkness. The end of the chapter. It doesn't have to be dark. We're going to show you why Jesus puts light on it. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, ate the king, continually at the king's table. And then the Bible reminds you of one little fact. And he was lame on both his feet. God didn't heal him. He was still lame. And every day, he took those painful steps. And it took him twice as long to get to the table as all of his adopted brothers. The Bible wants to remind you that even though his walk wasn't perfect, he still belonged to the king. And here we are spending all of our time in the church trying to clean up everybody's walk instead of introducing them to the master's table. And the Bible lets you know he was still lame in both of his feet. His walk wasn't right, but his covenant was. Wow. Hey, I mean, it's good. I don't have anything to do with it. I didn't write any of this. I mean, I didn't do it. I wish I could write that good. I didn't write any of this. This is amazing. This was already in your Bible when you got here. Wow. It's incredible. It's incredible. And so, lame on his feet. The walk's not good. God, this blesses my heart to know. 
know, I spent so many years trying to clean my walk up so daddy would give me the good stuff. I never needed to clean the walk. I needed to claim the covenant. Amen. Everything is possible to the man that knows he's under a covenant. Yeah. Amen. Now, I'd love to stop right here because this is so good. I'd love to just stop right here and just rejoice and shout. But the problem is, we're not all living in this. We're not all walking up to daddy's table with our mangled feet and sliding them up underneath the table so we can't see them while we eat. We're not. I wish we were, but we're not. And the sad part is, is one of the reasons that we're not is because of the snake in the grass Ziba. You thought he was just a side character. Just, you know, the guy who struts and frets across the stage for a little while and he's gone and you forget him. You know, he's the tree in the background. But in reality, he's the enemy. Because the story doesn't end. There's more about Mephibosheth. Look at this. Second Samuel 16. David is on the run from his son Absalom, who's trying to take his throne in Jerusalem. And David will not fight his own kid. Much like God will not fight you. And so David leaves Jerusalem, so Absalom can have it. Because as far as David's concerned, maybe he's supposed to. And as David is on the run, he's a little past the top of the mountain, and there's Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who meets him with a couple of saddled donkeys, and on them 200 loaves of bread, bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king says to Ziba, what do you mean to do with these? Ziba said, the donkeys are for your household to ride on, bread and summer fruits for your young men to eat, and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. It's a little suck up. King said, I don't like him at all. I'm just going to tell you right now. I don't like him at all. I can't stand it. You're going you're to hate him too. King said, where's your master's son? Ziba said to the king, indeed, he, he stayed in Jerusalem because he said, today's the day that the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father. Today's the day David's going to die. I'm going to stay right here and wait on him. So the king said to Ziba, Everything that belongs to Mephibosheth now belongs to you. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before your sight that I might, might find favor in your sight, O oh my king. That little snake. Everything promised to Mephibosheth because of the covenant of Jonathan just went to this snake in the grass, Ziba. So the story's not over. Thank God, right? Yeah. 2 Samuel 19, 24. The battle's over. David's home. Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, comes down to meet the king. And he had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes until the day the king departed, until the day he returned in peace. It sounds to me like he's a man who's been distraught at the entire time that his master David has been on the run. It doesn't sound at all like the kind of man that Ziba described to King David a few weeks ago that was excited that David was about to die at the hands of his rebellious son Absalom. It sounds like a guy that took a shower, had not shaved his face, hadn't even changed his clothes. He's been so distraught at having lost the king and not being able to set at his table. 25. So it was when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? Good question. Man, I've been good to you. Haven't I? Me eating at my table. You're know, like one of my kids. Why did you go with him? And he said, My lord, oh my king, my servant is seated. Your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself so that I can ride on it, and I'll go to the king because you're lame. And he slandered your servant to my lord the king. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore do whatever's good in your eyes. So according to Mephibosheth, what Ziba did was come in and said, You're too lame. I'll take the donkey and I'll go out and I'll tell David that you're on his side. And what Ziba does is take the donkey and goes out and lies about Mephibosheth. And David gives Ziba everything. And Mephibosheth says, I would have never done that to you. But you do whatever is right in your eyes. I've been tricked. I've been deceived. I lost what was rightfully mine because I let somebody else talk for me. Boy, I hope you can see where this is going. I lost my own understanding of the covenant inheritance because I let somebody else tell me what God thinks about me. I let somebody else tell me what the Bible says about me. I took some preacher's word for it and some teacher's word for it and some church's word for it. I was tricked and deceived by the very people who were supposed to be doing God's work. I was tricked into believing that it didn't belong to me, that I had to earn it, that I had to pay for it, that you were mad at me, that you didn't want me anymore. I did everything I could to please you. You just do whatever you think's right, God. Because I don't know. I'm living in a massive 
world of confusion. I don't understand the Bible. I don't understand prayer. I don't understand minister. I don't understand grace. I don't understand preachers. I don't understand heaven or hell. You just do whatever you want. And this is where about half the church is living. Yeah. Amen. I just wore out God. I don't know. I've been trying my whole life. Just do whatever you think's good. I just do whatever you want to do with me, Lord. Fortunately, God is better than David. Because watch what David does. The finish that says, All my father's house were dead men before my Lord, yet you set, your, you set me among those who get to eat at your table. What right do I have to cry out any more than the king? What right do I have? I don't have any rights. You just do whatever you want to me. So David says to him, Why are you speaking more of these matters? You and Ziba. Divide the land, closes the scroll, and walks out. And we never hear from Mephibosheth again. There was his chance. Let's act like we get one more verse. What if, when David closes the scroll, and the soldiers stand to let the king walk out? What if Mephibosheth had just said one word? Jonathan. Mm -hmm. The echo bounces off the palace walls and the scar hurts on David's hand. I think David had the heart of God. He would have done what God did for Abram and Sodom. Yeah, if there's 50, I'll say that. Yeah, if there's 40. I think if Mephibosheth had just said, John, I think David would have said, you know what? I'm not real happy with you. I'm not sure I trust you. I'm not sure I can trust you. But I was never good to you because I could trust you. I was good to you for Jonathan's sake. And I'm going to be good to you again for Jonathan's sake. And then I think he would have walked out and the fifth shepherd we got it all. You know what's happening to us? We have no covenant confidence. We're believing whatever lie gets crammed down our throat by somebody that's supposed to know better. And we're letting the enemy take half our goods in the spirit room because we don't think we're good enough to earn it all. And we're trying our best. And we weren't supposed to earn any of it. In a world where the Grace Church sits around and fights about 1 John 1, 9, and whether or not you've got to confess all your sins to even be the righteousness of God, nobody ever even talks about what confession means. It's the Greek word homologia, homo, same as, logia, word. Say the same word that God says. Every time confession is used in the New Testament in a positive light, it's homologia. It's say the same thing God says about you. When you talk about you, say what God says about you. When you talk about what belongs to you, claim covenant. Yes. Quit reciting how many prayer chains you're in, how many times you've been fasting, reminding God of your tithe percentage and where you're at in the Bible, how many people you witnessed to at Starbucks. Stop all the posing in front of a God that never gave a rip about how you were walking and only cared about doing good on Jesus' behalf in your life. So when you open your mouth in front of God, just say, Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus said to his disciples, you get to do something when I leave you've never got to do before. When you talk to Daddy from now on, you get to talk to him in my name. Yeah. And we get to the end of our flippant prayer and go, in Jesus' name. And don't even realize at all what we just spoke into the cosmos. That we just said to every Zipa that's been hanging around our little religious circle. We just tossed out the name of the one who hung at Calvary and passed between the pieces with his God for a degenerate, sin-filled world and said, I'm going to save them even though they don't walk right. And I'm going to love them even though they can't love me back. And we're fighting over who's really saved like a bunch of five-year-old babies in the church. And God says, I'll do it. For Jesus' sake. Yeah. You walk out of these doors tonight, have some covenant confidence. The rest of your life changes. You've been getting ripped off every day in business. You've been getting ripped off in school. You've been getting ripped off in
in your body. You've been getting ripped off in your mind. You've been buying the lie of every hellish zebra that crosses your path and says amen in the name of Jesus. You've been buying the lie that you're not righteous. Buying the lie that you're not holy. Buying the lie that you don't qualify to be healed. Buying the lie that God won't talk to you. Buying the lie that God's upset with you. That you missed God, now you're paying for it. You made God a promise and you'll never be the same again because you didn't keep it. You've been buying Zeba's lies forever. Well, thank God you have a better God than David. Who can be convinced by the enemy that you are everything he says you are. Your God knows better. It's time for you to. Wow. Father, thank you. Yes. Thank you. For the power of the covenant. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you that, Father, all we've really done is just peel one layer off the end. <laughs> and underneath is more beauty and, 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 and glory. And we're just getting there. They don't need a fifth service. They don't need Pastor Paul another day. They have the Holy Spirit. They have your word. It's chock full of covenant promises. Thank you. They want them. They didn't have them. All the promises of God are in Christ. They are yes. And they are amen. Forgive us, Daddy, for all the promises we make conditional. All the ones we think we'll give our way into getting them. We'll pray our way in the beginning. We'll fast our way in the beginning. We'll go our way in the beginning. God, we have sold the spirit of your son. We have asked to eat the king's table based upon our perfect walk. And the reality is it's none of us happening. And all of us should be agreeing with God that we have a covenant. And just as you bless me to the shepherd Jonathan's sake, bless your church for Christ's sake, bless this house for Christ's sake, you do not bless this house because they figured it out, because they have the right doctrine, because they're special, because they're cool, because they're relaxed. <laughs> you bless this house because of your favor, yes. through Jesus. Yes. You couldn't care less if they're in a the storefront or stained glass windows. Mm. You will run to follow Jairus as fast as you'll eat lunch with Matthew. And forgive us for thinking you prefer the prostitute to the Pharisee. The reality is that you have no preference but faith. Thank you, Father, that you will move through the robed pastor and clergyman the same way you'll move through the pimp on the street corner. You do not care. It has never mattered to you. The walk, what has mattered to you is the faith in it is covenant. Thank God that none of us can figure you out. Yeah. It's why we get to eat at your table. Mm. And Father, may we never lack in our confession. Let Zeba rob us again. May we realize who we are in Christ. I pray this favor in this house. As Romans 5 and 17 says, For those who receive abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, they shall reign in life through one man, Christ Jesus. And so we reign right now. In Jesus' name, if that's you, say it. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Calvin. We love you. Yeah.